We are in week three of a series that we call Re-Gifted. And if you knew, I'm going to say something to you now that you might, maybe you don't expect to hear this in church, but if you have been in church for a long time, you might expect to hear it. And here it is. God has a plan for your life. That is not just something that we throw around to encourage you and pump up your tires. So when you leave, you think, yeah, it's great. God's got a plan. It's actually true. I mean, there is purpose there is destiny. There is a reason why God created you. There is a reason why you're in this room right now. There is a reason why you exist and God has a plan for your life. And I think for so many of us, what we want to do is find out what that plan is and then start to live it and express it. Well, I tell you, that plan begins with the gospel. And the gospel is the message that God loved the world and He sent Jesus to pay the penalty for our sins and our mistakes took our place on the cross and He set us free from the power of sin. That's the greatest message you've ever heard. But can I just remind you this morning that the gospel is not an insurance policy that we take out on eternity. We don't believe in the gospel and then live however we want so that we can get to the end of our lives and go, Aha! I believed in Jesus. You have to let me in. That's not the whole idea of the gospel, just so we can get through the pearly gates. That's not what we're meant to be doing. No, there is an actual plan and purpose for your life. And one of the things I've discovered about people that follow Jesus is they are dedicated to Him. Their life is dedicated to Him. Their purposes are dedicated to Him. He's not something that's on the sidelines of life. He's the main thing. They fit in other things around the pursuit of God. And when you do that, you really start to live out and express that call. So I'll tell, every, tell you, every single person in this room right now, God really does have a plan and a purpose for your life. And the Spirit of God enables that pers- purpose by giving you spiritual gifts that aid you in the pursuit of the thing He's asking you to do. Because it wouldn't be very good if he asked you to do something and then didn't give you the power to see it through. But he does that. And when people start to follow God, follow the calling of God and pursue their ministry, that is exactly what we call it. We call it a calling. And God has one for every single person that's in this room. So what I want to do is I'm going to read to you out of 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4. It says, Now there are varieties of gifts but the same spirit, and there are varieties of service. That word service is translated 19 out of the 35 times that it's used in the New Testament as ministry. Because service is ministry, and ministry is service. If you're looking for a ministry, but avoiding serving, you're not going to get it. They are the same thing. They use the term interchangeably. He says, there's varieties of service, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. If you pray for somebody and they're healed, it's pretty clear that the power didn't originate with the person who said the prayer, but it must have come from a place beyond what we could see. That is a, what we would call a manifestation of the Spirit of God. It means that God becomes so plain and obvious in that moment that everyone says, aha, this must be God because there's no way that you did that on your own. And when, when the Spirit of God manifests His presence by gifting and gracing His church, He does it for the common good. In other words, it's not there for you to sit at home and just heal yourself you've got a sore back oh thank you Jesus you know like that's not there just for you it's actually meant to be there to serve other people so here's what we know every Christian has a spiritual gift but not every Christian has a ministry until that gift is re-gifted because you've received a gift you've got it Now, until you use that to serve other people, you don't have a ministry. The gift becomes a ministry as you use that gift to serve others. And when you breathe your last breath here and your next breath in eternity, every single one of us will stand before God and give an account to Jesus for what we did with the gifts that He gave to us. So the purpose of this series and even this message is not to make anybody feel guilty. That's not the point at all. What it is, is a blessing to you by bringing that question to the forefront of your mind 
while you still have time before you meet him and have that conversation to do something with the space between now and then so that when he says, what did you do with the gifts that I gave to you? You'll have an answer for him. And wouldn't that be nice? That's the whole point of this series. Now, I know it's a spicy opener. And I don't want any, as I say, I don't want you to feel guilty, but we are Christian people. And as Christian people, we don't put our theology here and our practical living over here. We don't divorce theology from practical living. It's all the same space. We live out of what we know. And what we know about God informs what we believe. It informs how we behave. It informs what we do with our time and our talent and our treasure. And we're bringing all these things together. So the title of my message this morning is, What's Stopping Your Ministry? What's Stopping Your your ministry because i've seen people with a ministry call gift and grace and it's not doing anything by the way where do you find your calling where is it well i say it's a combination of the gifts that the lord has given to you the passion with which you pursued them and then the confirmation from trusted leaders that can say ah that gift really is there we don't want to spend our lives pursuing a gift thinking that we're graced in a specific area but we're not really and our mum never had the heart to tell us because she said, you're good at everything, sweetheart. You know, so just do, just go. go. No, don't go. No, because what if you spent your life trying to pursue one ministry when you were called to another and you bore little fruit in this area, but you could have had a massive impacting ministry over here if you just had someone that said, stop singing, it's not your gift. <laughs> That's what people tell me. <laughs> we use the gifts that we have to serve the body, but of course it serves people outside of the church as well. And the role of the church is huge. It's just, it's, the role of the church is so big. We have so much that we're responsible for, so much that the Lord is asking us to do. We need everybody playing on this team. Like you imagine if you, or I'll explain it, if you do not like sport and you just don't understand anything about sports, right? On a basketball court, you have five players. If two out of five are playing the other three are just watching them play that team is going to struggle yeah. Yeah. well we're on team jesus and we are on the court right now i mean if you're alive and you're breathing you are on the court right now yeah. and what we can't afford to do on team jesus is to have a small minority of the people living out and expressing the call of god on their life well, the majority of the church watch that happen. No, no, we're all called, we're all gifted, we're all graced. And I think a big part of life is trying to discover how to use the gifts and graces that God's given to us. Now, Paul calls Team Jesus, he calls this the body of Christ. And he uses this analogy to the church in Corinth to help them understand that the body is meant to function and work together. You know, like, just think about it. If you take someone's arm and you, you, you cut their hand off and then you severed all the fingers, how is that going to work? That is what we call dismembered. And when the body of Christ becomes dismembered, it's not very effective. It actually functions very well when it all works together and everyone knows what they're supposed to do and everyone's operating in their calling and laying down their lives and serving the Lord. Just imagine what we could accomplish if every Christian on planet Earth said, I'm all about everything that you've got for me, God. Paul explains what the body of Christ is and how it works. He says, come on, like, you know, if you're an eye and not an ear, don't say, where's my sight? You're good at hearing. Just do that. Just do what you're supposed to do. And then he follows it up with this. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27. He says, now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Just look at the person next to you and say, you. Yeah, with this little sass. You. You are the body of Christ. And individually, oh, you went very really quiet. Individual, oh, I know it was a long word, guys, but come on. Individually, members of it. Okay, so we are the body of Christ. Now that we've got it out of the way, you know that the rest of the sermon is for you. It's not for the guy next to you, although it would help them. He says, now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church, God appoints first apostles, then uh, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, gifts of healing, helping, administrating. 
I reckon there's someone with an administration gift in here and they say, it's not a gift, I'm just good at it. No, it's a gift. I love that gift. Uh, as a leader of a church, I love people with the gift of administration. And if you do, speak to me after the service. It says, and then various kinds of tongues. He says, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, to all work miracles, to all possess gifts of healing, to all speak with tongues, to all interpret, but earnestly desire the higher gifts. What you got here is a situation where you've got a group of people that are gifted and called and graced by God, and yet in the middle of all of that, something is stopping their ministry. Something's preventing them from moving forward. I want to preach this message to you. What's stopping your ministry? And it's not time, because we all have the same time. Time isn't an issue. Priority is. Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added. There's a problem when we start to chase all the things that are meant to be added and forget to seek first the kingdom. So we seek first the kingdom, the other stuff gets added. So it's not time. Time's not an issue. We just spend it differently. We all have the same time. But I want to give you three things. Two of them you're going to see in the text that we just read, but one of them Paul speaks about pretty extensively throughout the New Testament. I want to give you three things that will stop you from living out the ministry call and, and grace that's on your life. And here is the first one. Submission. Or, or a lack of submission. Whenever you find somebody that's incredibly gifted but refuses to use that gift in, in the church and wants to do life completely isolated, normally they have a pride problem. They don't see how what they do should work with anyone else. It's all, it's all about them. And when I start to see that, I think that's dysfunctional. That's not going to work. You might be... Oh, amazingly gifted, like level 10 gift. There's no levels, guys, but level 10. ten you know what I'm saying, right? Like 10 out of 10 giftedness. Like the glory cloud has descended upon. We can't even look at your face, you know? Like the Shekinah glory, we put on sunglasses just to say hello, right? You are amazing, right? But if you're arrogant, you won't have a ministry. doesn't matter how gifted you are. And do you know why you won't have a ministry? Because people don't like you. It's true. It's true. You might be incredibly gifted, but if it's all about your gift and all about you and you refuse to work with other people, right? Because it's all about what the Lord has given to you and it's that, that arrogance comes through. You, you won't have a ministry because ministry is about serving people. It's about loving people with the gift that you've got. Can I tell you, there is a big difference between having favor with God and having favor with man. There's a big difference. People have favor with God, but no favor with the church because of the way that they act. Maybe they're a bit, a bit prickly. Maybe they're, they're hard to communicate with or talk to. But if you are a person that's given to pride and you don't want to work with the body, it's going to affect your ministry in a significant way. Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. And he's essentially saying to them, you've got to stop attaching value and status to the gift that you've got because you've got a group of people where they're saying, my gift is this. I'm good at this. Oh, you, you've only got that. What a stupid conversation to have. We need everyone to play their role no matter what it is. And Paul absolutely understands this. The, a, a gift still needs to function in the body of Christ. It's why he uses that illustration of a body because it's all meant to be connected and it works best when it works with each other. I, you imagine on a soccer field, if someone is, is appointed to be a goalie and they just go, I am sick of this coach telling me where to stand. I feel more like a striker today. So you know what? Forget this, you know, and they run down the pitch and then there's a swing in the game and then they go down and someone boots a goal through and people go, where were you, goalie? And you're like, don't tell me what to do. And, so, and then you have these, what a stupid argument that would be. You're a goalie. That's what you're gifted at. That's where you're meant to work. Your one job is to stop the other team kicking goals. And if you keep slipping away to do stuff, playing your own game instead of playing with the rest of us, how is the team meant to win? 
how is the body meant to win if everyone wants to slip away and do their own thing? It just doesn't really make sense to me. And I'll tell you something right now. I've seen God bench people, right? So you might still be on the team because you're a follower of Jesus, but you'll get benched. Do you know why? Because you can't be trusted. And if people can't trust you because you're playing your own game, it's going to be hard to see that ministry begin to thrive and succeed. And, you know, when people don't like this, right? and then maybe there's different reasons or motivations for it, I don't know. But when people say, I don't want to uh, work in with the church or, you know, report in, so to speak, or, or serve in with the church, right? What they normally do is leave the church and they leave saying, I can't find a good one. There's none. Anywhere. On planet Earth. Anybody that says to me there are no good churches, I'm like, oh, 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 I see ya. There's no good churches. Or this is the other thing they'll do. They'll start their own self-appointed itinerant ministry, right? No one's sending them. They send themselves. No one wants to endorse them because they don't trust them. And so they just want to move from church to church with a hot word for the pastor, but zero responsibility. When you've got no skin in the game, it's really hard to sometimes listen to some of those things where people just want to move from place to place. But if people hate submitting their gift to the body of Christ and saying, hey, how can I work in with what the body is doing to, to serve the church or serve the community? To be honest, you just, you just don't, you're ministering nothing. Nothing happens with it. And the gift ends up getting wasted. It's very quiet in here, church. Here's the first one is submission. Here's the second one, comparison. People just comparing their gift. That's an identity issue. How come they've got that gift? Or they're so much better at this than me, right? And they just compare their gift and their grace. You know, a huge portion of Paul's letter is written because there are insecure people in the church saying, my gift is not really worth anything. And this is what Paul's response is. He goes, no, guys, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. They're indispensable. We absolutely need them. Don't belittle your gift because it doesn't look like what someone else has got. Listen, you can't live someone else's life. You don't have their history. You haven't walked through what they've walked through. You're not going to walk in what they walk in. And if you spend your life looking down the lane of someone else's ministry, when you get to the end of your life, you'll be disappointed. And it was because you didn't pursue the things that the Lord had for you. You've got to get your eyes back on the prize. You've got to get your eyes on the things that the, that the Lord has called you to do. And I tell you, you will be successful in that space. You can't bear the fruit of someone else's ministry. You can only bear the fruit of your own ministry. Just remember this. It's the Lord, it's the Lord that promotes people. So if you see someone and they look like they're getting promoted, praise the Lord. He's doing something with them. Don't be upset. Don't be disappointed. Don't compare. Just take what you've got and be faithful with it. You know, I grew up playing basketball and I always wanted to win the trophy at the end of the season. I always wanted to get the MVP. And you know how many times I won that? Zero. Shocking. I know. How is that even possible, you ask? No one knows. But, but I didn't, I never won that. But the coach wouldn't give out, you know, trophies to everyone. It's not like today, guys, you know. <laughs> so they would give out one trophy. You remember the days? Yeah, yeah. And so they give out one trophy. And, and they could either give out the MVP or they could give out, you know, one or, of a number of different types of trophies. And I would, I've got a number of trophies at home. And they all say the same thing on it. They say the most consistent award. <laughs> That's my superpower. I just keep saying yes. I just keep turning up. I just keep going. I, that's, that's what it is. I, I mean, I, I went to practice and I never missed practice and I was, I was never late. And when I got onto the court, I just worked my butt off, right? And I did it every single week. And so for me, now as a leader of a church, I see this in other people. Do you know what the Christianese word might be? for the most consistent, we call that being faithful. And as the leader of a church, I would rather have somebody on my team that was faithful than someone that was highly gifted, but all about themselves. 
I'd rather take someone with the right heart and that says, I want to serve God's people and serve God's house because you can grow in your gift. And the more opportunity that you have, you grow in your gift. It's amazing how humble people tend to succeed because the Lord doesn't oppose them, but embraces them. And they find themselves with increasing ministry opportunity because they're humble and they want to learn and they want to grow. And the Lord keeps saying yes to them because they keep submitting to God and going through the process. It's amazing what happens when you don't compare your gift to other people and just be faithful with what you've got. We give our kids presents at Christmas time. I know we're amazing, but we do. It's just great parenting. And, and we spend the same amount on all of them. And imagine if we gave them all gifts and one of them looked at what the other one had and was so disappointed that they didn't get what the other one had, that they took that and they put it in their bedroom, locked it away and said, I'm never taking it out. How would I feel as the gift giver? I'd actually almost be a little bit offended, I, I, I think. Like, well, you're not even going to take it out? No, nope, because you didn't give me what they had. So I'm not using anything. Man, I wonder how God must feel sometimes. When the thing that takes people out is that they're comparing the grace on their life to the grace on someone else's life. And they end up becoming jealous to the point that they lose their identity in the stuff of this world and in the eyes of other people rather than putting their identity in Christ and realizing that your value is derived from the fact that you're a child of God and then just never using the gift. Man, if, if this stuff, this identity stuff, this comparison trap gets you the gift on your life, it'll be totally wasted. The first one is a lack of submission. The second one is that you compare your gifts. Here's the third one. Paul speaks about this throughout the New Testament. You sabotage. It's called self-sabotage. And people self-sabotage with unholy living. And every article you read about this is sad and it's heartbreaking. I mean, how many stories do we read? That person no longer leads that church. That person no longer has that ministry. That person had an affair. So, you know, it's not like the Lord can't redeem people's lives. Come on. He does. He forgives us. What could separate us from the love of God that's found in Christ Jesus our Lord? But do you believe me when I say there's difference between having favor with God and men? So you might be forgiven absolutely sure but you don't always necessarily have that favor with people because they're like well with this there's maybe a, a crack in your character somewhere right now i believe that god can redeem all things so if you're in a situation where there's something back in your history hey god can restore it and redeem it but you you, you got to repent of it and being caught is not the same as confession does that make sense how many people do we see that get stuck in the cycle of being addicted to, you know, sex and pornography or maybe they're, they're addicted to power, right? I've seen churches collapse because the senior leaders had so much authority and power and they exercised that in such an unhealthy way that leadership culture was toxic and the church basically collapsed in on itself. This is the kind of stuff that sabotages churches and they're absolutely ministry killers. You know who knew this? Peter. Peter writes this in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15. He says, As he who called you is holy, you also be holy, which means to be set apart for a designated purpose. That's what that means. Sounds like calling to me. Set apart for a designated purpose in all your conduct. In all your conduct. Not just the conduct that people can see on public display, but all your conduct. Wherever you're conducting yourself in that space, make sure that you are being holy. If you have a leadership gift, you're a leader in any way, can I just encourage you to know that the standard is not, like, not sinning? Because if we think that the standard is like, as long as I avoid sin, as long as I don't actually sin, then I'm going to be okay. But that's not the standard. You remember that what Paul said to Timothy? He said to be, if you want to be an overseer, then you should be above reproach. 
What does that mean? It means that people shouldn't be able to point to all these things in your life and say, yeah, but I always see you coming out of that place. And, you know, why were you, you shouldn't be in there. And that, that, that's not the right place for you. And why are you doing that? And there should, there's not meant to be all this stuff that people point to. In other words, they, he would say, you know, you, you come out of somewhere where you're not supposed to be. And they say, what were you doing in there? And you're like, well, I didn't actually sin. Didn't have my eyes open. You know, I wasn't actually sinning. It's like, oh, okay. That's not the standard. That's not the standard. The standard is don't go anywhere near it. And you know what I've discovered? People that love the Lord don't want to be anywhere near sin. So what we're meant to do is if that's where sin is, I'm going to draw my, my boundary all the way back here so that there's, I'm above reproach. And that's the way that we're supposed to do it. Now, what happens is, is that when people habitually, continually cross the line, you know, the Bible says your sins will find you out. And eventually it happens and we see that. And, and you know something? That when, when you ruin your witness... You lose spiritual authority and ministry opportunity and the, gift, and the gift is wasted. And I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. You already know this and you already see this. But it's good to live with a healthy awareness of the kind of things that can come up in life and prevent people from living the life that the Lord has called them to. Come on, clean hands, pure heart. Clean hands, pure heart. Clean hands, pure heart. You start to live like that and see what God will do. I'm telling you, God has so much purpose for His people. We don't want to get in the way of what the Lord has asked us to do. In fact, listen to this. Ephesians 2.10 says that we are His workmanship. You know what that means? It means that we are a new creation. Behold, the old is gone. The new has come. We're a new creation, created. Anybody that creates something has a purpose for that thing. Can we agree on that? Find any invention on planet Earth. You say, what does that do? It's got a purpose, right? You've been created. What do you do? I don't know, but you have a purpose. God has made you, created you, purposed you, destined you in Christ Jesus for good works. Do you know what the, th- the word works means? It means duty, service, yeah. ministry, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is what the Lord has done. He's forgiven you and allowed the presence of God to fill you. He's given you gifts and he's called you into service. And all you need to do is just say yes to him and walk in it. He has cleared the path. He has made a way where there is no way. And all you need to do is just say yes to Him. You know what I've discovered? New creations carry new purpose. When you're a new creation, you don't just express your old purpose. If you have made a decision to follow Jesus and nothing in your life changes, you are going astray. Because the moment that you give your life to Jesus and you're a new creation, ah, you have a new purpose. God is going to use you to do something on planet Earth. And He's going to gift you accordingly so the thing that He's asking you to do will actually be fruitful. New creations have new purpose. We don't get caught up on the old stuff that we used to do. I have a new purpose. That purpose comes to the forefront of my mind. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all the other things will be added. I think we got a little bit backwards when we were pursuing all the other things and forgetting the one thing that we're meant to be pursuing first is actually His kingdom. How do we actually pursue His kingdom? Well, I'll give you a really great guide for this. Say yes to everything He asks you to do and you should be very successful in pursuing the things of God kind of makes sense you know baby christians are consumers they come into church and they think look at this this is awesome coffee for me church service for me small group for me oh a workshop that i can attend oh for me it's all for me this is amazing right baby christians are consumers you know why they don't know any better Mature Christians contribute. Mature Christians contribute. They don't just look at what is and say, oh, 
Let me have more, 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 more. <laughs> I was at a conference during the week and that actually came up. He said, if you're always getting more, 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 where's the more going? How much more do you actually need? You better start to give out because if you're just having more and you're not actually giving out, you're going to get, well, he said constipated, but whatever. <laughs> you get all blocked up, let's say that. Baby Christians think it's all for them. Mature Christians go, I'm here to serve. And we shouldn't forget that. So here's the situation for you. The Lord has gifted you, called you, graced you, given you spiritual gifts to enable you. And I tell you right now, the devil can't stop you because he can't stop the Lord. So the only thing that's really stopping you now is you. So you are gifted in some way. You might not know what your gift is. That's right. We're going to pray for you at the end of the service, maybe to find out what that is. But you are gifted. There is a calling on your life in some way. Don't take that gift and store it, lock it away, and hoping that in one day, somewhere in the distant future, opportunity will open up when the planets align and everything is perfect. No, today is the day of salvation. Listen, your life is a mist and a vapor. You don't even know how long you're here for. And one day when you get to the end of your life and you stand before God and, and you, you say to Him, but I, 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 I was going to, there's no reward for good intentions. So what you need to do is use today to serve the Lord. And just use what's in your hands. Just use what's in your heart to serve the Lord. Don't keep storing what the Lord has been giving. Make sense? I get emails from Coles shopping. You know, they sent me this email saying, hey, you've qualified for a free month of online shopping. And I thought, you know, they deliver it to my house for free. And I always delete that email, but I thought, you know what, I'm going to do this. And it's the best. <laughs> they, they just bring it to you. Like, I know it's so obvious, but like you're sitting there uh, watching TV or whatever, and there's a knock at the door. Here are all your groceries. It's amazing. And so I was online and I was ordering. And it is very helpful, but you, you can make a few mistakes. Um, I just wanted six bananas. That's all I wanted. I kept on clicking the number, six bananas, right? That's nearly a week. But what I didn't know is that they come in bunches of six. So I ordered 36 bananas. And when the guy knocked on the door and he gave me 36 bananas, I'm like, I don't know if he was thinking I was running a backyard zoo or I've got some strange addiction that needs to be identified and labeled, right? I just looked at this bag of bananas and I was like, that is not what I want. What am I going to do with 36 bananas? I took it in and showed the family. I'm like, here you go, guys, bananas. They're like, great. And I was like, more. They're like, what? More, 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 more bananas. So we got bananas coming out of areas. What am I going to do with all these bananas? And I thought, well, it's really weird. I, going back to Coles and saying, here are five bunches of bananas. I don't need these anymore. And I thought, you know what's easier? I will store these bananas, right? So they, they actually went right pretty quickly. And I chopped them up and I put them in the freezer. So now they go in my smoothies. So now, for three, in the next three months, I'm, I'm fine. So I've got, you know, I've got all of these bananas and I stored it. Now I, I feel like, I feel a little bad because maybe someone in, went into the shops earlier or, or later that day and they said, I just wanted a banana. It's can't because Ben's got all of them. All of them. And I feel like the Lord will forgive me for taking all the bananas and storing them. But what will He say to us when we take all the things that He's given to us for kingdom purpose and we just hoard them and hold on to them and never give them and never store them because we don't like serving. We don't like any of the things that I've spoken about today. You know, Jesus did tell a, a story about this and it, it goes something like this. Luke 12, verse 16, he told him a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, 
eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, I just want to stop on this next slide. But God said to him, good on you, mate. You've saved and you've stored. Now you've got eternity to enjoy. Put up your feet, legend. That is a, uh, a translation that I don't use very often uh, at Bright Church. That is the hopeful Christian translation. Um, which is not really a word-for-word translation. They don't really pay attention to any of the Greek. Um, It's not even a thought-for-thought translation. Um, This is just really the sentiments of Christian people that hope when they get to the end of their life that the Lord will say something like this when they've done nothing with what He's given them. Surely they're hoping that this is the answer. This is not really a translation. This is nothing. Here's what the Lord actually says. He says, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you've prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. How do you be rich towards God? You be rich towards God when you be rich towards his people. How do you give to God? You give to the church. How do you serve God? You often serve the church. And we got people trying to find a way to get out of that. Lord, I love you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to serve you. I hear that. I I receive that, my son. Is there anything I can do for you? Serve my church. Is there anything else I can do for you? You know, is there any way that I can get out of this? No. If you want to be rich towards the Lord, you serve his house. You you, you serve the people of God. That's That's how he asks us to do it. Don't store what the Lord supplies. Don't store what the Lord supplies. Don't waste your life. Don't waste your gift. You are gifted. You are called. You are graced by God to do something of significance on planet Earth. And while we are on the court right now, Team Jesus, we need everybody playing their part. Just imagine what the church could do if people engaged in the body and said, yep, I'll do whatever it takes. I will serve you, Lord. I will serve you people. I love you. I will seek first the kingdom. Just imagine if we took the words of the scriptures and applied them directly to our lives. Imagine what the future could be. Imagine what the church would look like. Listen, there are so many reasons why people might struggle to to serve. I don't know, maybe you've had a bad experience, but listen, I'm a big believer in not letting past experiences define the rest of your life. Because if you do that, your next bad experience could be the end of all the things that God has for you. And it's not because He didn't have them. It's because you stopped saying yes to Him. You say yes to Him and and, and see what it's like to live this adventure called life as you pursue the kingdom of God. So here's what I want to do. How about we do this? Just close your eyes for a minute. I want to pray for every single person in this room to find the purposes of God. But I'm going to tell you where that purpose begins. It begins with the gospel. If you're here in this room and you've never given your life to Jesus, I don't know why that is. Maybe this is your very first time realizing and hearing that God loves you so much. And He is prepared to pay for all of your sins and mistakes. But if He doesn't pay for it, you'll have to pay for it. And the price, the penalty is to be separated from Him in outer darkness for the rest of your life. God doesn't want that for you. The Lord stands here in this room right now, willing to forgive every single person and to start a new life. And it begins with you saying, I believe that, Jesus and I make a decision to follow you. If you've never asked Jesus into your life, you say, Pastor Ben, there is sin in my life. I know I've made mistakes. I I, I don't know what to do. This is what you do. You say, Jesus, forgive me. And the moment you do, your entire life will be different. You become a new creation and the purpose that God has for your life will follow that decision. So if you're here today, whether you're watching online at home or you're here in this room right now, And you know that today is the day that you need to say yes to Jesus. Slip up your hand and say, that's me. And I'll see your hand. If you're far from God and you know that you need to say yes, awesome. Are there more people that say, I want to say yes to Jesus? Even if you're watching online right now, you're sitting at home. Yep, God bless you. Are there more people that are saying yes to Jesus right now? 
If you're at home, you can say yes and just pray along with us in just a moment. But if you're here and you've never given your life to Jesus, so you know that today is the day to recommit your life and your purpose to Him, just put up your hand and say, that's me. Thank you, Lord. Hey, church, we're going to pray together so the people that are praying don't have to pray on their own. If you're watching at home, you can just repeat this prayer as we say it here together. You ready, church? Dear Jesus, I thank you that you love me, that you died on the cross for my sin. I receive you today as my Lord and Savior. And I choose to follow you every day for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name. And everyone gave God some praise. Come on. Why don't you stand on your feet? Hey, we want to pray for you today, church. If you are here right now and you are not sure how the Lord has gifted you or graced you, you don't know what your ministry call is, can we just have a moment with God where you're just honest with Him? And maybe you haven't said yes. It's been such a long time, you don't even know where to begin. Do this for a moment. Just close your eyes right where you stand. If you know that you're not serving the Lord the way that He would have you serve, and today there's something about this message that you just, it's grabbed your heart in some way. Maybe it's convicted you. That's good because we want the Lord to do that. But if you were to say, today in this place, Lord, I want to say yes to you and yes to serving you. However it is that you ask, just raise your hand right now and say, that's me. I know I'm not doing everything the Lord's asked me to do. Yep, awesome. Is there more people that say, oh, yep, awesome. Are there more people that say, I, I know I'm not using my gifts, my call, my grace. I don't even know what it is. If you don't know what it is, raise your hand. I'd be surprised if you were using it and you didn't know that you had it. So that puts you in the same category. If you're here right now and you say, Lord, I want to serve you. I want to pray for you. Father, I pray for every person that's responded right now and is saying they want to find out the purpose for which you've created them. There is a call. There is a spiritual gift that's on their life. And I pray, God, that your spirit would come and speak and move. Lord, would you speak to them? Would you begin to stir them? I pray, God, that you begin to pour out vision into their hearts, vision into their life. Help them to see what is. Help them to see what could be. And I pray, God, this morning that you'd give them the courage to pursue it. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to start to worship the Lord. And if you raise your hand today and you just want prayer for this moment, maybe you want someone to begin to speak over your life, maybe help you to refine what you're called and gifted and graced to do, then I want you, during this worship moment, I want you to get out of your seat. We have a team of leaders that would love to pray for you. We want to help you to find everything that God's created you for. You ready? Come on, let's worship God. Hey, well, thanks so much for watching. We hope you enjoyed the video today. Like, subscribe and share if you think this content will be helpful for you or others. If you did give your life to Jesus today, please let us know. We would love to walk that journey with you. You can check us out at brightchurch.com and we look forward to seeing you either in person at a service or online. We hope to see you soon.